Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Dr. Michael Morelli. I'm the Assistant Professor of Theology and Ethics at Northwest Seminary and College, and I'm pleased to welcome all of you on behalf of Northwest and the John Williams Weavers Institute for Septuagint Studies. Uh, allow me to introduce to you Dr. Joel Carrico. Um, he'll be presenting on when does translating change the meaning of scripture, how the translator of Greek Exodus and Jesus aligns his biblical law to fit his culture. Dr. Joel Carrico received his doctorate of philosophy in Oriental Studies from the University of Oxford. His research focuses on Greek translations of the Hebrew Bible, particularly Exodus. The interface between translation and culture, especially as it relates to Jewish law and its interpretation in the Hellenistic context, has guided his research and publications in Exodus. His work opens up questions as to how the translators engage with the Hebrew scriptures and how their interpretations affect the way we view ancient Judaism and Christianity. I'm really pleased to have Joel presenting with us. Uh, whenever Joel and I get together, we end up talking about law, living law, translation, and all sorts of fun things. And so to give you a little bit of a breakdown of how this evening is going to go, Joel will be presenting for about 50 minutes, and then we'll have ample time for questions and answers and, and dialogue. And so when Joel's presentation is complete, I'll be uh, moderating that dialogue and we'll have lots of time to engage with his presentation. So without further ado, Joel, the floor is yours. Thank you all for coming. It's great to see so many of you here engaging in this topic, in the Septuagint. Uh, I'm really excited to present tonight. And yeah, this uh, is a subject that has fascinated me for a long time. And I think there'll be a lot of things for, for each of you. Uh, and, uh, some, some of it will be a bit more on the academic side, some will be a bit more uh, on the lay level side, and I've made it, this presentation in such a way that you, uh, wh wherever you stand, knowledge of Greek, Hebrew, any of that, I'm hoping you'll be able to follow along without any, of, without any knowledge of Greek or Hebrew, and so it's, it is for everyone, and uh, I'm really looking forward to the time at the end for the Q&A when I know some of you, uh, some of you I, I can see who, who I invited out, uh, have, have, will have quite uh, intricate questions, I'm sure, regarding some of maybe the syntax, grammar, whatever, of what I'm presenting. So, thank you for being here. And now, I have a friend, okay? Oh, he's more of an acquaintance. Uh, a friend of a friend. He likes to, to talk a lot about religion and philosophy, and rightly so, since he has acquired over half a million followers on the social media platform YouTube. Uh, maybe you've heard of him. His name, his name is Alex O'Connor, and he, he also goes by the moniker Cosmic Skeptic. I, I personally think he'll be the next big name, uh, the next Richard Dawkins when it comes to atheistic responses to a belief in God. He, he's really great. So I was sitting in a board game cafe in Oxford a while ago, and he, and he happened to be there. Our, our common friend invited him, and I, I have permission to share the story, by the way. So, so we started chatting. And he began talking about a debate he was a part of with a Christian apologist. They were arguing back and forth about whether or not Christianity was true. And then at the end, Alex pulled out a, a trump card. He cited a law from Exodus and asked how on earth a moral God might ever prescribe such a law. The law reads as follows. If a man strikes his male slave or his female slave with the rod and he dies under his hand, he will surely be avenged. Yet, if he survives a day or two days, he will not be avenged, because he is his money. That's Exodus 21, 20 to 21. It's that last part that's, to put it lightly, uh, a bit of a hang-up, wouldn't you say? The slave will not be avenged because the slave survived a couple days, and because the slave is the master's property. You can, you can see why Alex pulled this law out of his back pocket, right? How is that command just? He asked his opponent. And what did his opponent say? Nothing. He had no response. I think this apologist with non-response is often mirrored in our own lives as we, and I'm, I'm here speaking as a Christian, as we come across, across difficult passages and especially difficult laws in the Old Testament. What do we do with these? Are we missing something? What are they getting at? Were they meant to be eternal case laws applied to every similar legal situation for all of Israel's history? What happens when the content of these laws find no resonance with a later culture like our own? 
Should we disregard them? Cast them aside and say, that's just the Old Testament? Maybe. But I wonder if we could look to our spiritual forebears for help here. What if we looked to the very earliest interpretations of laws like these to see what they did with them? Now, in reality, this might only be needed in part for Exodus 21, 20 to 21. Without these ancient translations, had Alex and his apologist opponent taken a closer look at the text, they would have seen that this passage is in the middle of a larger section that is concerned primarily with capital crimes. That is, which cases should allow for the death penalty and which should not. The law is probably not saying that a master who strikes and kills his slave should not be punished if the slave dies later, but rather that the master will not be put to death because direct causation between the master's attack and the slave's death cannot be determined. The master may well be punished for striking the slave. This topic is addressed later in the code in verses 26 and 27. But here, the law is concerned only with whether or not to capitally punish him. If you follow the flow of thought in these laws about capital punishment, you can see that the lawgiver is trying to walk the thin line between various mitigating factors and capital punishment. Here, the mitigating factors are the temporal distance between the strike and the death of the slave, a few days, and the fact that the slave was his property. The consequence is lessened from the death penalty now because one, the slave owner faces a loss. His slave and the time working the slave would have provided him, and two, because there's no direct causation determinable. The law is ruminating on what we might call in our modern context, reasonable doubt. This is a case that is supposed to be juxtaposed to the previous law where, there, where a free man is struck and then, and this is the important contrast, then he falls to his bed. There the man falls, is bedridden, and is clearly gravely injured. But in the, in the law we just talked about, the slave seems to be unharmed and goes on with life. The Hebrew literally says that the slave stands, translated survives in many translations, which contrasts to falls in the previous, the previous law. The slave owner may well have struck a blow that was in fact the direct cause of the death of the slave, but this is not fully determinable. The slave seems fine. That the slave owner loses his slave and also loses the value of the slave's work is a punishment of sorts, and for this reason, the case gets deregulated from capital punishment to something else. Now, the law doesn't actually tell us what that something else is here because these laws aren't about that. Like I said, they're about dividing difficult, the difficult dividing lines between capital and non-capital crimes. So. I told Alex this in our conversation at the cafe. He paused, looked at me, and laughed, saying, well, had the apologist said that, I would have lost the argument. You see, it's very easy for people in our culture to miss, and age to miss what many of these biblical laws are getting at. The laws are almost like proverbs that need to be read in apposition to each other, and more on that kind of thing later. They are a culture and a world far removed from us, and they trouble us. And I'm not saying we shouldn't be troubled. But I wonder if, as I said, we can look to our spiritual forebears to see how they dealt with these laws for interpretive help. And we actually have a very early interpretation of these biblical laws. We find them in what is often called the Septuagint, and you're here for that. It's the name of the whole corpus of Greek translations of the Hebrew Old Testament, and the specific translation of the book of Exodus comes from about 250 BC, around there. That, that is 200 years, 250 years before Jesus. That translation does some pretty interesting things in the law we just looked at, and it could have helped that discussion I, uh, that, that I had. So we see here, I've given you the, the Hebrew, and then an English translation of the Hebrew. I've given you the Greek, the Septuagint version, and then the, a translation of that Greek, if, if you can follow along there. So we're just kind of looking at that fourth line down, that second English translation. If someone might strike his male slave or female slave with the staff, and he might die by his hand, in a trial he will be avenged. There's a subtle difference here. And those of you know, that know Hebrew will know that there's nothing in the phrase, nakom yinakem, he will surely be avenged, the infinitive absolute and intensifying uh, construction, nothing in that that refers to a trial. But you need to know that this phrase is debated. Now, many ancient and modern commentators agree that nakomina came is another way of referring to the death penalty. But it's not the exact same phrase used elsewhere in these laws for capital punishment. Elsewhere, the phrase is mot humat. 
The reason it says he, the slave, will be avenged rather than he, the master, will be put to death is probably because the former phrase indicates that the courts step in to avenge the dead slave since they may not have had family or a legal advocate to do so nearby. Now notice that the translator of Exodus adds in the phrase decay which is the, uh, in a trial, which is the way that you would refer to be, to be, to be in, uh, it's the way that you'd refer to being in court uh, for a trial according to the legal language at the time of the translator. Previous commentators on the Septuagint have missed the precise definition here. If you want to see this meaning, you can see it in the documentary, documentary papyri we have from that time. And by documentary papyri, I'm referring to the texts that have been found from the ancient world that were not uh, intentionally preserved through scribes over the last two millennia. We have found law codes or court transcripts, letters, and other such things in the trash piles and dirt mounds of ancient Egypt and elsewhere. They show us that this phrase decay was legal language at the time for in a trial. But as I said, that's not what the Hebrew text directly says. It is, however, what might have been meant or implied if it were judges who were going to act on behalf of the slave who has no family or legal advocate nearby. Remember that I said that this is probably why a different term for the death penalty is used here. The slave would be avenged in court because the perpetrator would be held accountable by judges. It is possible that the translator then has actually filled in the context with this translation and, give, and given us an easier read of the ambiguous phrase, he will be avenged. At the same time, it is fascinating that this translation also resonates with the social context of the translator. At that time, and without getting into the gritty details in my opening example, at that time, cases involving the death penalty would need to be ratified by the powers that be, namely the Greek authorities. You need to know, and this is important, that the translation was composed in Hellenized Egypt. That is, Egypt after Alexander the Great had already come in and imbued the culture and ideology of Egypt with Greek legal values and authority. The Greeks had colonized Egypt, including the practice of law to, to some degree. Cases involving the death penalty would now have belonged to Greek high courts, hence the need for a trial, decay. It is also very possible that at the time of the translation, a master killing a slave might not warrant the death penalty according to the law at the time. By including in a trial, the translator may have been distancing the law from the death penalty, since the judges could in fact decide to do otherwise. So that the master will suffer vengeance in a trial, or uh, there will be, uh, he'll, the slave will be avenged in a trial, could also be viewed as an example of the translator updating the law according to his own time and context. Maybe. Maybe the master faces death. Maybe they don't. Uh, it will be decided in a trial. So my question then is, how do you feel about this change? You might say, well, it's still pretty close to the Hebrew. Uh, in fact, it might actually be a contextual rendering that helps us understand the otherwise vague Hebrew. Sure. But how do you feel about the law possibly being changed a bit to fit the later context? Or, how do you feel about later generations who do not have access to the Hebrew text reading this law, uh, and then they read this in a slightly new way in their Greek version, in their, in their Bible? They wouldn't know there was the change. What if someone knew what the Hebrew or Greek text behind your Bible said, but decided to translate with a bit of a different meaning. Now, your Bible is not really based off of the Septuagint translation, so I'm not saying anything about someone changing your canonical text if you're a Christian or someone of, uh, 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 who ha holds the scripture in authority. Modern Old Testament translations are based off of the Hebrew text and not the Greek text most of the time. Little asterisks there. But I want you to keep these questions in mind as we proceed and things will uh, intensify as we move along. Let's take a look at another law. This is Exodus 21, 7 to 11. And if a man sells his daughter as a slave wife, she will not go out free as male slaves go out free. If she is not acceptable to her master, who selected her, he will allow her to be redeemed. He has no authority to sell her to a foreign people, since he has dealt treacher treacherously with her. And if he selects her for his son, he shall do for her according to the regulation for daughters. If the master takes for himself another wife, he will not reduce her food, her clothing, or her right of cohabitation. And if he does not do for her these three, she shall go out free for nothing. There will not be money paid for her. There are, admittedly, many questions that come up when we read this law. And we don't have time to cover them all. 
I especially, along with the last example, will not be covering the topic of slavery as it relates to the Bible. There's just not time. If we want to talk about it after, we can. But for our present discussion, suffice it to say that this law presents a worst case scenario. This is not a father giving up his own precious daughter to a man in marriage. That's a best case scenario. No, this is a father selling his daughter to someone as a slave, and by all appearances as a slave wife. A slave wife is among the lowest rungs that existed in the hierarchy of ancient Near Eastern society. She is one of the least privileged and most vulnerable to abuse. But you can, you can see some of the protections here, right? The master can't sell her off to some foreign land. She has to go back to her family. If she is a wife to the master's son, the master has to treat her like a daughter, which prevents things like sexual abuse. So, so, so far, so good, right? That's decent treatment. But then there's that last section. The master gets another wife. Maybe he's obliged to take on his brother's wife according to Leverite law, marriage laws. Who, who knows why? But he gets another wife. The law stipulates that he must provide her with food, clothing, and what's probably conjugal rights. It's not clear what the last term right of cohabitation means in Hebrew. The Hebrew term is onah. This Hebrew word only occurs once in all of the Hebrew Bible, and it's here. How, how do we even figure out what it means then? Well, we, are, we do have the Septuagint to help us. The translator of Exodus gives us our earliest interpretation of onah and says that it means intercourse. So that's really helpful for us who want, to, who want confirmation concerning our translation of the Hebrew and who want confidence in the biblical text we read. In this case, the Septuagint isn't changing the meaning of Scripture. It, it's giving us the meaning of Scripture because the Hebrew is honestly just not clear. It's just, it's, it's very difficult. How else are we going to know? So here's a case where your English Bible is largely based off of the Septuagint, at least when dealing with one, this one little word. The meaning of the law, then, is that the wife is allowed to have sexual relations with the master, to bear children to the master, which is really important for her future survival and social status in that society. But, let's be honest, we're still left with a bit of a bitter taste in our mouths. Food, clothing, intercourse. That's it? That's all he has to provide for her to be obligated to be a slave wife? What if he beats her? What if he constantly shames her in front of the whole city? What if he prostitutes her out? What if he works her fingers until they're blood and bare bone? There are a thousand other things you could think of, right? Are those things all fine? What's this law getting at? Well, maybe our, earliest, our ancient and earliest interpretation can help us out again. Uh, or I should say our most ancient interpretation can help us out again. There's uh, something else that you might have missed in this translation. Go back, read it over again. What is different from the Hebrew? And in 10 seconds, can anyone type it in? Can someone give me what's different? If you got it, type it in the chat really quick if you're super quick. Five, four, three, two, one. Did anyone get anything? Have we got anything in the chat? Nothing. No one. All right. That's okay. Did you miss it? It's the first provision. He shall not deprive her of her necessities, is what it says in the Greek translation, not her food. Hebrew says, he shall not deprive her of her food. She'er. That means food. What on earth is going on here? Well, can I let you in on a really cool moment in my life? Like all the best moments in life, it involves being in a library. A while ago, I was, I was seated in the library across the street at Trinity Western. Actually, I think I was, I was standing when it happened. Either way, I had just pulled out a hardcover copy of uh, Ancient Papyri, and this, these were the ancient documentary texts I was just speaking about, and this volume focused on marriage contracts. I was skimming through it when all of a sudden my eyes caught hold of something. I was reading a marital contract from the Ptolemaic period, that is, the time period when the translation of Exodus was created, this Hellenized Egypt. I looked to the middle of the contract, to the spot where the provisions for a woman were stipulated. These were the things that a husband must not deprive the wife of, or else she has the right to divorce him. Can you guess what I found? What I found in not only one, not two, but in Greek marriage contract after Greek marriage contract for over two centuries. You don't need to know Greek. You can, I've just underlined it and showed you there. I've got, uh, uh, and I've got Exodus down at the bottom there. Now, 
What gets repeated are the necessities and the clothing allowance. They are often the first things in the list of provisions, and they are the exact two things found in the Greek translation of Exodus in the section on the provisions for a wife. The translator swapped out food, she'er, for tadeonda, the necessities. He then translates clothing from the Hebrew with a specific term found in these contracts for a clothing allowance, hematismon. And it was here in the library at that moment. I had my, my eureka moment. I definitely almost threw my books and ran down the street. Because do you see what's happening? Did you see what I saw? The translator has inserted the Greek contractual language into the translation. He ignores what the Hebrew says and instead updates the text to match Greek marital contracts. I, I was the first person to notice this and, and that was exhilarating. Now you might be asking yourself, so what? Why does it matter? Well, think about it with me for a moment. What does this new translation do? What does the necessities mean? Well, that's just the point. It, it's indeterminate. It could, it could mean a host of things. And guess what? In Greek marital, con marital contracts, it did mean a host of things. The law presented by the translator now allows a slave wife to divorce her husband should, she, should he not provide the necessities as defined by Greek culture and law. In other words, this slave wife has a host of rights and claims on her husband that go way beyond food, clothing, and intercourse, like the Hebrew says. Some of these rights would include being treated in, uh, with honor in the marriage and in society, but some would also be very practical. You see, around the time of the translation, the king, Ptolemy II, introduced a new means of spreading his coinage throughout Egypt. He made a new tax that required, and required everyone to pay it, but with his coins. This was called the salt tax. The salt tax was taxation for salt provided to residents in Egypt. It was also specifically linked to marital contracts and the husband's duty to pay it for his wife. In other words, the salt tax was part of the necessities that had to be provided for the wife. So can you see now how the translator has not only given new rights to the slave wife, but also updated the text so that it covers the realities of his own day. What do you think? Did the translator have the right to make this change to the Hebrew text? You might say, no. But can I give you something to think about? What was the original Hebrew law getting at? When it says not to deprive her of food, clothing, and intercourse, was that all the husband had to do for her to keep her as his wife? No. We know that because a few verses later, it says that a master who severely beats their slave has to let them go free. Food, clothing, and intercourse, it's not an exhaustive list. It's just a short list generalizing what a husband needs to give a wife according to the very ancient context this part of Hebrew Exodus was written in. This threefold list represents a wife's necessities from a time well before the translation of Exodus. The original Hebrew law is much older and from a more distant culture than the translation. The point of food, clothing, and intercourse is not that these are the only things that could ever need to be provided to a wife. Rather, they are a generalized list that points to the idea of that which is necessary of a husband to provide to his wife. I think if someone pulled the Hebrew lawgiver aside and said, I love what you did there, food, clothing, intercourse, yeah, need to be given to a wife, but definitely not a bed. She can sleep outside with the animals in the cold. I think the Hebrew lawgiver would turn to that person and say, you are an unjust fool. That's because the law was originally getting at the idea of the necessities. So, do you think the translator was wrong now? Is it okay to have changed the text? What if it more accurately represents the genre and intent of the original law? Would this translation change the meaning of scripture? Now, I'm going to throw another wrench into this dilemma since I've mentioned genre and intent. I'm going to hazard a guess and say that when most of you re read the statement, he will not deprive her of food, clothing, and intercourse, you thought to yourself, okay, those are the exact th three things that have to be given to her. Why did you think that? Well, I think it's safe to say that it has something to do with our conception of law codes, of law. Law codes, to us Westerners, they're absolute. 
They speak of specific and exact rules that establish the norm for the future. It's, what, it's what's called a practical authority. If you do X, you get Y every time. A practical authority. This way of thinking about law is actually very close to the ancient Greeks. It is not, however, how very ancient Hebrews and their neighbors thought about law codes. Law codes in the ancient Near East were, were often what we might call epistemic authorities. That is, they did not provide a once and for all ruling for every case in the future, but rather provided a framework for thinking about specific cases, wisdom one might say, and then left the decision of a particular case up to local judges. We're pretty certain this is true because out of all the surviving court documentation we have in the ancient Near East, we don't see law codes being cited in court cases as practical authorities. Even in the Bible, you will be hard pressed to see the case laws of Exodus or elsewhere applied in the narrative sections of the text. Check out what this scholar says, and this way of viewing things is growing in influence now among conservative, liberal, um, ancient legal and biblical scholars alike. As scholars have noted, the Bible nowhere instructs judges to consult written sources. Narratives of adjudication, such as the trial of Solomon in 1 Kings 3, likewise lack references to written sources of law. No one collection of laws, nor even all of the corpora taken together, display a striving to provide a comprehensive set of rules to be applied in judicial cases. And that's from uh, Joshua Berman's Inconsistency in the Torah. The Hebrews did not think of law like we think of law. They seem to have had, seen it as an epistemic authority, and we see law as a practical authority. So when we come across this law in Exodus, we think of food, clothing, and intercourse. Uh, that's it. But the lawgiver is trying to tell you to think about what is being said. What is the wisdom here? How does this law compare to the other laws being given? Where do you need to fill in the blanks or, and resolve the tensions? How might we think what justice... Uh, would look like in a particular, uh, how might we think about what justice might look like in a particular circumstance like this? Then take that legal wisdom and apply it elsewhere. And now we might actually see this kind of wise and sagacious legal reasoning occur elsewhere with respect to this law from Exodus. In the first century of the Common Era, we find a free Jewish woman named Babatha claiming her rights in a, mar in a marriage as based on this law in Exodus. So I've given you the document there. Now, remember that this law that we're talking about is about slave wives, not free wives. But don't you see what's going on? The law doesn't need to apply to just slaves. It's meant to give legal wisdom that can be applied to other situations. If a slave is given these rights, then so also a free wife. How much more? So we come back to the translation of Exodus. Did you get it right? Is he in line with the spirit of the law, not just the letter? You might be itching to say, yes, I think I'm on board now, Joel. But hold on a second. Reserve that judgment. Let's look at another example. And uh, I promise you from this point on, we'll be entering into the realm of controversy. So if your brain was shutting down, as mine often does after 7 p.m., uh, hopefully this will be the needed adrenaline spike for you to get back into this. I have a question. Can you think of a verse in the New Testament where Jesus supports the death penalty? Now, now, I know that's a complex theological question and a bit out of left field. But can you think of a verse that, at face value, shows Jesus referring to the death penalty in an approving manner? I can only think of one. It's this verse. So this is Mark 7, 9 to 10, and it's paralleled in Matthew 15, 4. And Jesus said to the Pharisees and scribes, you splendidly ignore the commandment of God so that you can keep your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and mother, and, and here's a quotation from the Old Testament, the one who speaks evil of father and mother must certainly die. And I've just given you the Lexham English Bible there, but that's basically replicated in most translations. So is that it? Jesus cites the Old Testament that approves of the death penalty for speaking ill of father and mother, right? Well, maybe, but let's back up for a second. 
The law that is, that is cited by Jesus here is from the Septuagint. The law Jesus cites is written in Greek. So shouldn't we look to that translation first? And it just so happens that the verse Jesus cites is in the section we've been talking about already. Take a look at the following laws. So I've given again Hebrew, an English translation of the Hebrew, the Septuagint, and then an English translation of the Septuagint. And I've given you two separate verses here. So anyone who strikes father or mother shall be put to death. That's the Hebrew. And the Greek, whoever habitually strikes his father or mother shall be put to death. That's the Septuagint. And jumping to verse 17, which is verse 16 in the Septuagint. Different versification. Anyone who curses father or mother shall be put to death. And the one speaking ill of his father or mother shall meet an untimely end. Now, I've done something in translation there, and we're going to talk about it. But first off, just to clear the air, this law is talking about adult children who curse their parents. And by curse, in the Hebrew text, it probably means, it does not mean to swear at, it probably means something more like disavow, with the idea being that you are, excuse my, my language, telling these, your parents quite literally to, to go to hell. That's what this person's doing. It seems to be tantamount to parental abandonment. In the Greek version, the law seems to be more focused on the verbal element. It's, it, it seems to convey speaking evil of a parent, not necessarily disavowing and hence abandoning them. It is possible that the translator didn't catch the disavowing or abandoning idea in, inherent in the original uh, Hebrew law and just focused on the act of speaking itself. But I'm actually not going to focus on that. I, I, I understand there are lots of questions about this law, but we're not going to focus on that, that part. I want to instead draw your attention to the punishment clauses. That is, the consequence for each given action. I've outlined in red the Hebrew text and its English translation. In the Hebrew, the death penalty is prescribed for either striking or cursing a parent. The wording for the death penalty, mot yamat, is the exact same and there's no contextual or text critical reason to interpret otherwise. But look at what the translator does. In the law about striking a parent, the death penalty is clear. The translator uses a verb that means put to death, thanatao. In fact, I looked up every use of this term, thanatao, in the centuries prior to and after the translation, and it always refers to the legal death penalty when it is used with reference to humans. The translator also puts a noun in the dative before this verb, which is thanato. This literally translates something like in death or by death, thanato. So a literal translation could, could be something like, um, and I know I know literal is, is not a good word necessarily to use. Could be something like, by death, he shall be put to death. A bit strange, but we, we will come back to that. Now look at the law about cursing father or mother. The translator uses a different term. Here we find teleftao. It's in the purple. This verb means to die. The translation also has the fronted thanato, by death, in green. So we could literally translate this something like, by death he shall die. Now, you will rightly raise the question, well, isn't that basically the exact same thing? By death, he shall be put to death, and by death, he shall die. Sound like the exact same thing? Yes, they do. And that was the claim of previous scholarship on these verses. Up until my, my recent work here at Northwest and then at the University of Oxford, I asked the question, are these just synonymous phrases? Are they just saying the same thing in two different ways? How would I find out? Well, I did a deep dive into all of our Greek resources from that time period. I looked at all the terminology that Greeks use for the death penalty. Instead of giving you a big chart, I can just show you the terms typically used here. If you want, if you want a big chart, I do have a, an article in uh, JSCS from last year, or better yet, um, hopefully uh, my monograph will be out rel relatively soon and you can check that out, which will have even more expanded charts. Anyways. Classicists agree that the types of terms for the death penalty are, and this is a quote from a classicist, they're pretty unimaginative. And we can see here that they are. One of the things I found in my investigation was this. That second verb from Exodus 21.17 in the purple, uh, that verb teleftao is never used to prescribe the death penalty in Greek law. You can see that it is not in the list above, and sorry if you don't know Greek, this is one slide where you just got to trust us. And even outside of Greek law, this verb is not used in and of itself to refer to formally putting someone to death. So by itself, the fact that the translator chose teleftao, that's very odd. Unless they're just unskilled, they don't know what they're talking about. 
So it, it, it can be stated with some degree of confidence that a person who knew Greek well, who read this law, would probably not understand tell of ta'o to refer to the death penalty. So that's something to consider on its own. But there's another thing. Remember that fronted noun in green, thanato? Well, when looking through the Greek texts that survive from the ancient world, I found there's a, a specific idiom that occurs. By an idiom, I mean something like cats out of the bag or it'll be your funeral. It's a set of words put together, creates a specific meaning when combined together. The idiom is this. Thanato, that green we had, uh, plus a verb that means to die, it means meet an untimely end. Um, meet an early demise. Here are some examples. So this first one here is from Dinarchus, and it's just the, just the time right before the translation within 100 years or so. Uh, and you can see to, uh, uh, it says to take up a cause of those who have met a violent end, and there it's the same thanato with tel of ta'o, just, just morphologically different there. Uh, and banish or execute any in the city who have broken the law. And at the end there, you've actually got the death penalty. So in the exact same sentence, you've got the death penalty and you've got thanato tel of ta'o. So that's something to consider. And then Endemides, also from the century prior, uh, it says, after the Thebe Theban destruction, Alexander demanded the lives of the orators, but the Demos sent Demides to, to beg for them. This Demides persuaded Alexander against putting the orators to death, saying, permit them in or by the rhetoric of Athens to meet an untimely demise. So in ancient Greek, you can put thanato before other verbs that refer to dying and it creates an idiom. What it conveys is not a natural, peaceful death at the end of your life, but rather an untimely demise, an early death, getting hit by a bus, choking on a hot dog, telling your wife that yes, that dress makes you look fat. All these things will bring about an early and untimely demise for you. The idiom is found throughout Greek literature and in the first example, you can actually see, as I said, that the same phrase uh, as our text in Exodus is there, beside a reference to the death penalty, which is pretty strong evidence these phrases were not considered synonymous. In this first example, the idiom refers to someone dying early. In the second example, Demides, Alexander the Great wants to put some orators to death, but Demides persuades Alexander to do otherwise. Since Demides is arguing against the death penalty, what Demides suggests must be a reality that is not the death penalty. That's tautologous. And if, you, you, to say, is, to say it, it, that they are the same would be tautologous. He, he describes that alternative using this idiom again. You can see it in red there, there. So this is a case where the idiom is actually used as a direct contrast to the death penalty. It can't mean the death penalty. I'll give you two more examples, this time from the Septuagint. And we'll just stay here for just one second. I'm not going to get into the details, but for those of you who know Hebrew, you can see that the same idiom appears in other translations in places where there's a different underlying Hebrew than what we find in Exodus. And just like in the previous examples, the context of each of these verses is groups of people who will meet an untimely demise, an early death. So then, what does it all mean? Let's bring it together. I am claiming that Exodus 21.17 in the Greek version does not refer to the death penalty. Instead, the translator intended that his readers would read this law with an imprecation as its penalty. By imprecation, I mean there is no here and now punishment prescribed. He's saying, the person who speaks ill of his parent, that person ought to get their comeuppance. They ought to meet their end. That's not the death penalty. That's saying, bad on you for doing that. I hope it catches up to you and God gives you what you deserve. Now, here's the thing. In Greek law, it was actually very common for imprecations to be the punishment prescribed for certain crimes. So while we might say, what's the point of a law that has no tangible punishment? They did not think that way in the ancient world. So in this reading, Exodus 21.17 in the Greek version actually changes what the Hebrew text says. The death penalty is removed and an imprecation is put in its place. This is in contrast to 2115 with Thanato Thanatus though. I already said that Thanatao always refers to the legal death penalty when referring to humans and the fronted Thanato is actually a nod to the typical formulae for the death penalty that often include Thanato before them, like Thanato Zemiao, which we saw in the example from uh, Dinarchus. With an act of early death, he will be punished. 
Now, I, I imagine you can guess where I think the translation, the, the change in the translation stems from. Greek law and legal values, once again. Now, it's not the time or place to lay out all the details, but suffice it to say that Greeks did suggest the death penalty for those who habitually struck their parents. This is what verse 2115 says. But they would not put to death children for speaking ill of their parents. Remember, the translator lived in a Greek dominant culture. So it seems like the translator removed the death penalty in 2117 in order to align the law with the Greek legal values of the day instead of translating what the Hebrew text directly said. The translator leaves in the death penalty in 2115 because Greeks already agreed with that. In fact, the translator adds in the habitual element through the present tense tupti. I don't know if any of you noticed that. It's, 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 it's anomalous. It's strange because everywhere else you have patasso in the aorist tense for those of you who know Greek. It's just out of nowhere. So how do you feel about this change? 2117 went from do put them to death to don't put them to death. Has this translation changed the meaning of scripture? Well, Houston, we have a problem here because now we circle back to Jesus. What version of the law does Jesus cite? He cites the Septuagint version. What does that law teach, at least according to its original intent? It says that the one speaking ill of father or mother ought to mean an untimely demise. It's an imprecation. There's no death penalty like the Hebrew. Some of you might say, wait, what does that mean for us that Jesus cited a law that doesn't actually say what our Old Testament say? Others might be saying, aha, so Jesus actually didn't support the death penalty when he cited this verse. These are both understandable responses. But in both cases, it's, it's more complex than that. So bear with me for a second because uh, this might get a bit confusing uh, if it hasn't been already. While it is true that Jesus cites the law in his changed version, that does not mean that Jesus intended for the law to be understood in the same way that the original translator intended it to be understood. Here's why. The original translation of this law happened almost 300 years earlier, in about 250 BC. That original translation did not change the meaning of the Hebrew text from the death penalty into an imprecation. Uh, sorry, that tr original translation did change the meaning of the Hebrew text from the death penalty into an imprecation. However, over the next 300 years, there will be Jews, Greeks, and others reading this translation as it spread like wildfire across the Mediterranean. Over time, it is possible that some Jews looked back to the Hebrew text and said, wait a second, this Greek version doesn't say what the Hebrew says, but the translation's already out there and it's not like they could change that. So it is possible that they read it and just said to each other, uh, you should read this as a death penalty despite the weird Greek. It's also possible, it seems probable, that over these 300 years, the idiom I told you about dropped out of use. There are hints in Philo that this is the case. So it may be that in Jesus' day, while Exodus 2115 and 2117 had a different Greek text, they both came to be traditionally understood as the death penalty. That's one side of the coin. The other side is that, and this is confusing, I understand, that Jesus may have not been teaching in Greek. If he was teaching in Aramaic or citing the law in Hebrew, he would not have cited this Greek version. The reason we see the Greek Septuagint version in our Bibles is because the author of the Gospel of Mark wrote in Greek. And when Mark cited the Old Testament, he pretty much always cites the Greek Bible that most Jews were reading, which is this Septuagint version. And of course, there, we can talk about recensions and all that after if you want, but generally speaking, this was, this was the major one. So while we see the Greek version, we might need to imagine this is a placeholder of sorts. It might stand in for what Jesus really said, which wasn't the, actually the law in Hebrew or Aramaic. So then, it is possible that the original meaning of the Septuagint law was lost over 300 years, and it's possible that Jesus cited the law in Hebrew or Aramaic, but Mark and Matthew give it to us in the Greek version because it's the Greek version everybody knew. So, are you confused yet? I mean, I am. This is, this is tough stuff. It, sometimes it just it, it rattles your head a bit. <laughs> Can we say that, that Jesus, like the original translator, intended for us to understand that the death penalty was no longer in effect because of his citation of the Septuagint? My honest answer is that we don't know. We're, we're at a bit of a stalemate. There is, on one side, an interesting quote from Josephus. 
a historian at the time of Jesus, who says that the Pharisees had a tradition where they would not put people to death for reproaches, that is, for verbal abuse. That tradition might go against what we find in the Hebrew of Exodus 21.17, like we saw. But it does match up with what I am claiming for the Greek version. In light of my argumentation so far, you could also add Leviticus 24.16 in its Greek version to this line of reasoning, which is also about verbal reproaches actually naming the name. Changes the, if you check out Leviticus 24.16, the same thing happens. Teleptao appears out of nowhere. So it seems like the death penalty has gone there too. That is not beyond our current discussion. So it is possible that this new understanding of Exodus 21.17 had in fact made it into some Jewish way of thought at the time of Jesus with the Pharisees. Perhaps it made it to Jesus himself. At the same time, the argument um, within the Gospels that Jesus is in relates to not providing for one's parents, which might be more in line with the Hebrew wording and concepts than the translated law if it's about abandoning your parents. So maybe he was citing the Hebrew law. We can talk about that after if you want. So again, we're at a bit of a stalemate. But I wonder if we can find a way forward even without an answer on whether or not Jesus intentionally cited the changed law. How? Like I said earlier on, we shouldn't approach the Old Testament law as a practical authority, but as an epistemic authority. It is legal wisdom, not statutory law. In the more ancient context, disavowing one's parents or speaking ill of one's parents might have had different societal ramifications than later on. In societies like that of the translation of Exodus, and us for that matter, in these cases the severity of the crime might not be as great. The parents aren't in as much danger or their honor is not as much at risk. There might be more societal safety nets. Should we not then perceive the law a bit differently? What if the death penalty was too great of a consequence in these later contexts? What if it were actually wise to not consider the death penalty for a crime like this in a different context and time period? And what if Jesus viewed the law this way too? Regardless of whatever text form he was citing, what if he is quoting the law to give the principle not to win a 21st century court case through the practical authority of a statutory case law? The principle is that one must have regard for those who cared for them in infancy and adolescence and that a parent's societal protection is of the utmost importance to God. What it means to breach this responsibility, whether to disavow a parent or unwaveringly speak evil of them, and what a penalty for these actions might be is up for discussion. It's more of the spirit of the law than the letter. And what if the translator of Exodus was also thinking this way about the law? Now, it's possible. Though it, it is also possible, and I will say this uh, quite clearly, that the translator was more focused on being culturally sensitive than sensitive to the genre of legal wisdom. I'm, I'm not making a decisive claim otherwise, either way. It's very hard to know. The question is, of course, how far can we press this? Uh, um, so, so all that in mind, these three examples in mind, uh, how, how far can we actually press this principle of, of legal wisdom? Because that's probably what you're thinking. How far can the epistemic authority principle go before it breaks under its own weight. Can I give one last brief example? This, is, this, one, this one takes the cake. Uh, so, so while it's really not the type of conversational topic we have at this hour, at least where we are, of tea and polite discourse, can we talk for a second about bestiality? Exodus 22:18. Anyone lying with an animal will surely be put to death. That's the Hebrew. The Greek any animal lying with your domestic flock, by an act of early death, you will kill them on the spot. Sounds very different, right? Okay, we're only going to focus on, on one thing. It's that first word, any. Or anyone as we have here. In Hebrew, the word any, kol, is not gendered. By, by gendered, I mean how some languages use grammatical gender when distinguishing between words. Think er, si, das in German, or le, la in French, like for example. Um, Hebrew kol, any, is not gendered. In Greek, the word for any is gendered. You can use the masculine gender, pas, to refer, prim to, to, to refer primarily to humans, both male and female. Note that we do not have pas in the translation. We have pan. Pas would be used as in any who went to the party, any referring only to humans. With the masculine, Animals could also be included in the mix too if humans were also within the any that is being referred to. That's pas. The feminine gender 
is used only for females. And the neuter gender, pan, is used only for animals, inanimate objects, or abstract concepts. So if I said, any who went to drink from the river, in the neuter gender, it would refer to any of the animals who went to drink from the river. Okay, so take that knowledge and bring it to Exodus. In this law, originally about bestiality, in Hebrew, Exodus, something strange happens in the translation. The translator uses the Greek neuter for that word, any. Everywhere else in the Septuagint, and I mean everywhere, I think there's only one example where I believe the same thing is going on, but everywhere else, the neuter gender pan, any, is not used to refer to humans. If pan stands on its own, not modifying an already neuter noun, it does not refer to humans. It refers to animals, inanimate objects, or abstract concepts. Even outside of the Septuagint, I looked through every single occurrence of pan in the documentary papyri and inscriptions before the Common Era. It is not used to refer to humans. So here, in Exodus, what does neuter pan kimomenon mean? Anything laying. According to the Greek standards of the day, it really seems to mean any animal laying with your domestic flock. Now, okay, I know some of you keeners out there will go looking in your Septuagint grammars and commentaries. If you want to ask about potential objections to my claim here about pan, uh, that you might find in like Weavers or Maroka. Um, that's technical stuff, and I'm really happy to engage that in the Q&A afterwards, but that's it's too much for, for the, the present discussion. That kind of meticulous grammar discourse doesn't suit an entry-level presentation. So engage with it if you want. About, uh, we'll talk about that after. So then, any animal lying with your domestic flock, what animal must this be? Well, what is outside of your domestic flock? Wild animals. In fact, ktenos, used here for domestic animal, is the antonym of therion, wild animal. So it is probably the case that the translation is saying that any wild animal that lays with your domestic flock should be put to death. Any of you who might be farmers or no farmers know good breeding practices, which is, and the ancients did too, that wild animals produce less tameable offspring. They, they, and uh, you, you don't want wild animals copulating with your flock. You, you want them dead and gone right away. And uh, that, that's actually common in the ancient world too. And in my, uh, my upcoming uh, monograph, I go into all, all of the uh, different husbandry practices at the time. They were very meticulous in, in these practices in uh, the ancient world and even in Egypt. Another thing you can note is that the translator, and maybe you did notice this, suddenly switches to a new verb here, apokteno, to kill. It's in purple. Greek legal scholars unanimously state that this term was fixed in its use. Its legal use was to indicate an on-the-spot killing, like without trial or anything. So why is that verb here suddenly? Because the law is talking about killing an animal on the spot, not a human. You couldn't kill a human on the spot in that culture. You wouldn't use apokteno to refer to the legal death sentence. And now you're, you might be asking to yourself, Joel, this new law has nothing to do with bestiality. And you are correct. It does not. What happened? And you know my answer. You've read the title. Greek law. Greeks and Egyptians did not legislate against sexually deviant behaviors. Sure, adultery and a few other things were criminal, but something as odd as, as bestiality was not. So the translator once again has updated the law to fit his context. But this update is more like a total overhaul. The subject matter of the law is completely changed. It went from bestiality to animal husbandry. They did, in fact, have strict like, breeding practices, like I said, at this time. Now, what are we supposed to do with this? Has this translation changed the meaning of Scripture? Well, would any of us here today argue for capital punishment for an odd or deviant sexual behavior? Uh, I'm not going to try and list that kind of thing here, but I imagine most of us would be uncomfortable with killing someone because of something like bestiality. What if the translator was in a similar context? What if it were a battle just not worth fighting, as I imagine for many of us would consider it? This specific act is not on the front lines of the problems in our or the translator's culture. But still, how do you feel about a translation that changes the biblical text like this? Does the category of legal wisdom or epistemic authority break under its weight? Well, out of deference to the ancient way of epistemic legal authorities, I'll let you be the judge 
examine the case, and make the final call. To conclude, we have looked over a selection of laws from the book of Exodus. Some of these laws are hard to understand, and the Septuagint translation has, moved, has shown to be an aid and companion for us in certain texts. In other places, the translation moves beyond what we might expect and begins to harmonize the text with the culture the translator lived in. It may be that this is simply a case of secularization and giving in to his culture, but it could also be viewed as his understanding of these laws according to their more ancient context, that of epistemic law or legal wisdom. Some of the subtle adaptations might then be in line with the spirit of the law and not the letter. In some cases, the translator seems to push pretty hard away from the original text like we just saw. How you wish to judge the translator's efforts is yours to decide. But at first turn the questions you ask him back to yourself. In practice, how do some of these laws integrate with your faith and life? I wonder if it will look as different from the translator as you might think. I want to thank you for attending the seminar. And as we move into to q and I want to invite anyone who might be interested in studying the Septuagint or the Bible at Northwest or the Weavers Institute to come and check us out. Email me or others. Thank you for coming out. We would love to work with you and dialogue about your interests and goals. It's been a pleasure to bring some of you my research and ideas. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. Uh, please join me in giving Dr. Joel Kirko a virtual round of applause for his uh, very detailed and thoroughly researched presentation. Um, I suspect we'll have a lot of questions and engagements. So the way that we will approach this is we actually uh, are in a classroom that's outfitted for audio playback. So um, if you would like to type your question, I can review it and call on you to read it out. Or if you just want to raise your hand um, you know, using the raise the hand function, I can call on people in order and you can uh, give Joel your question. He can hear you and he can respond live and you can have a lively back and forth. So. Yeah, by all means, we have plenty of time for questions, comments, clarifications, and I know that Joel is game for that, so. Absolutely. Yeah. Am I okay to use my software on the computer? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Just as people are maybe gathering their thoughts, um, as you were presenting, there was one individual who made a, uh, a comment in the text box saying, um, uh, law is better translated as principles in Greek IMO, which, as the young folks tell me, uh, stands for in my opinion. What do you make of that, Joel? Uh, depends on context. <laughs> uh, depends on where you're using the word law. Um, if you're using the word nomos, is that what they said, nomos? Uh, they didn't, they didn't, didn't specify. Okay, they didn't specify. Uh, yeah, I mean, it depends on, uh, uh, like this presentation is kind of, Pointed towards. They said nomos, yes. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so nomos. If you're if you're talking in a Greek courtroom, I think they'd beg to differ. Um, but if you're talking about the roots of the term nomos, yes, principle, and can nomos be used? Um, let's say, uh, I mean, Paul in Romans eight, you seem to see him using nomos. As kind of as, as a principle and, using, and doing kind of like a pun and play on words with the namos of Moses and then the namos of the Spirit, and so like there's like this principle of the Spirit, but then the law of Moses, but they're the same. It's like, kind of like a pun going on. So I think it just depends on the context. But yes, as a general rule, principle is, is pretty good, and I mean Torah, what which is what is translated namos in so Torah being Hebrew and namos being Greek, uh, yeah, Torah would mean something like instruction rather than you know, like statutory law. That kind of thing. So yeah, it's 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 a it's an insightful comment. Other questions or comments? Uh, John, would you like to uh, vocalize your your question here, or if if you prefer, I can read it out. Whatever works for you. Okay, it looks like I'll be reading this out. So John writes, if the translation differs from the original, to what extent is it authoritative? Yeah, that's a very good question. Well, part of the problem, like there's a, there's a whole host of ideas that and issues that, that, that get connected to this. Um, first off, if it's differing 
from, uh, let's say, a, a, a section or a text that we know well and we can really quite easily discern what it says in the Hebrew and there's really no dispute, then uh, do we need to talk about authority um, if we are grounding our authority in the Hebrew text, um, being the progenitor of the, of the Greek of the Greek text. So in those cases, uh, no. But then I gave you an example here, and then there are other examples, let's say in Hebrews, I think it's Hebrews 1, it might be 2, where, I think it's Hebrews 1, uh, there's a, a text that's cited from the Septuagint, I think it's, let all God's angels worship him, and then you go to look at that up in the Old Testament, and it's not there, in your Hebrew, it's not there. Because it seems like that's been that the Masoretic text has lost that, and the traditions we've had have lost that, and I believe it appears in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, but for a long time, we didn't have that. We didn't even have that verse, but we had it in the Septuagint version in Hebrews, but it wasn't in our Hebrew Bible, and it wouldn't be in our English translations of our Hebrew Bible unless we're basing it on the Septuagint. So there's another wrench to throw into the whole uh, mix, because it seems like the Septuagint there is giving us our actual earlier text, and, there, and had been for a very long time, and is therefore, I think we could, should probably say more authoritative, because it's giving us the earlier text. But then we do have the problem when we, well, like, this whole pres or part of this presentation was on, which is, let's say, when the, Jesus is citing a law that has a, uh, has a different meaning, in its original translation at least. Yeah, it's, 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 it's difficult. And I mean, part of the problem here is also what, I, what I, hadn't, I haven't said in this presentation, but many of you might know, is the majority of the citations of the Old Testament come from the Septuagint, or this, this translation, uh, this historical translation, uh, and, and so we're, let's say 90% or so in the New Testament. And so if the New Testament authors are using the Septuagint as their Bible, that they're communicating their theological messages about Jesus and the church um, with, then what does that say? They were okay with it being the authority even when in, I'd say most of the time, it's very small matters that it differs. And a lot of the time, it's hard to even know um, whether or not, let's say, Paul is adop adapting his Old Testament citation to his own context. And so if Paul's doing it and making small changes, and the Septuagint sometimes differs a little bit, but they seem to be fine with it, then I'm of the opinion that we should probably be fine with it as well. And, um, and I recognize that that's just a hairy situation. It's, 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 it's hard to, to find grounding there. Um, there. There are so many issues that go into this. Uh, one that comes to mind is even just Jeremiah. Jeremiah being about a third shorter in the Septuagint and probably indicative of the more original text. And so our Hebrew Bible is having a third more of text that was not earl the earliest. So how do we do with that? Is the Septuagint more authoritative there? Um, I feel like people have to decide these things kind of on their own and recognize that the world of the Bible and of the, the text we've received, sometimes we don't have cut and dried answers. And sometimes uh, there are, there's uncomfortable things with what the text that we've received. And a lot, of, and this is, we're talking about the, such a small majority or a small percentage here of, of cases. And so it's something that, yeah, that I wrestle with too. Uh, I think if the New Testament authors are okay with citing the Septuagint as their source for, the, for their theology, even in places where it differs, and I think they probably knew it differed. I don't think Paul was untrained. I think Paul had dealt with the Hebrew Scriptures, but he seemed fine with the Septuagint, partially because, I imagine, his audience had the Septuagint. And uh, he's not going to change the translation that they have, lest he be accused of some sort of... Um, theological uh, and biblical game where he's trying to, to make a meaning that is not there. And so uh, I think he just uses the text that they had, that people had, and they were okay with that. I even think of, uh, like, there's, there are cases where it seems like, I think it's Romans 9, Paul has an amalgam citation, I think it's Romans 9, of Isaiah 28 and Isaiah 8, where it's specifically in the Septuagint text, there's this intertextual connection in uh, Greek Isaiah of the one who will be ashamed, uh, who who trusts in him won't be put to shame, and then uh, the, the rock passages in 28. I believe I believe I'm getting that right. And there's like this little addition of uh, the one who trusts uh, ep of toe, 
and this f of toe gets moved in the Septuagint version, or not, gets copied and pasted into a similar context in, um, uh, that now relates the two texts. And Paul seems to draw on that Septuagint change in his own citation. And so then the question is, if Paul's happy to do that, how can we um, say otherwise? Perhaps we need to have a more missional understanding of what it means to, for the Septuagint to be used so much in the New Testament in that uh, they're using the Bible that's on the ground. This is boots on the ground, biblical interpretation. They don't have the luxury of using a different translation like we do. They have this translation, and so they're, they're fine to use it, and uh, in that way, we, we should be fine too. I'm not sure if that completely answers your question, though. It's a very hard question that many people have thought about, and I feel like, I mean, the Greek Orthodox Church chose one way, and you might have to just come to kind of your conc own conclusions on this. Uh, to a degree, it's still a question mark above, above me. I'm, I'm not sure. Thank you. I mean, it is interesting thinking about Paul's situation in the, in the sense that uh, he was already dealing with people who were uh, questioning his own authority and his theological readings and dealing with other people. So having to stick with the text that everybody was reading uh, to avoid further charges. We have more questions that are coming in. Um, there's one uh, from, from Mark. Mark, would you like to uh, ask your question or would you like me to read it for you? If you'd like to ask your question, just un unmute your mic and go for it. I will take the silence as uh, voting for me. So Mark says, thank you. From any or all of the examples you provided, is there a possibility that the Greek translation is actually based on a different underlying Hebrew text other than the Masoretic text? In other words, the text we often have under our English Old Testament translation. In other words, is the difference in meaning a result of the possible different manuscripts in the original Hebrew itself? Very astute question. Yeah, you're talking about a, diff a different forelog, as they say, um, kind of the text, the Hebrew text before the translator that they were translating from. Because you could say, oh, all these are interesting examples, Joel, but what if the Hebrew text they had was just different, right? Uh, let me just quickly scan in my brain here. I, as far as I'm aware, there are no significant or notable variance in any of the examples I gave you. Uh, as f I don't think any Hebrew text exists or any tradition that would point otherwise. All of this seems to be stemming from the translator. Um, maybe someone can pull up uh, like Kennecott or, or, or whatever uh, and, and show me otherwise, but as far as I'm aware that these, it's the same, as far as we can tell, it's the same Hebrew text. And I mean, what, especially with the Mot Yumat, with he will be put to death, the death penalty one. I, I, yeah, there's just, there, there is no other t text attested and it's such a straightforward phrase um, that it just doesn't seem to ever have been tampered with. Uh, the next question is from somebody by the name of Zach. Zach, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, I get it. Up. Um, so, assuming that Jesus quoted from a Septuagint text that wasn't correct to the original meaning, what does this say, if anything at all, about Jesus' omniscience? Yeah. Well, that's, a, that's a whole other ball game there. Uh, now again, we, I mean, you kind of have to go back into what I said in that it's very possible Jesus did not cite uh, the Septuagint law. What I was trying to communicate, and maybe I failed to do so, was that Jesus might have just been teaching in Aramaic or Hebrew, uh, and then when Mark comes in and says, okay, potentially based off of Peter's notes, as history would tell us, uh, okay, Jesus talked about uh, anyone cursing father or mother here will be put to death in Hebrew or Aramaic. Okay, well, we use it like we were just talking about. We use the Septuagint in our broader culture. And so we're just going to put the Septuagint in his mouth, even though he didn't say that. And in that case, the, what you've said uh, is, is almost, it's moot, right? Because he didn't actually even say it. And it's just what we have as a placeholder. The Septuagint text almost as a placeholder to the Hebrew text. But if Jesus did speak in Greek, and he was teaching in Greek here, and I think there's good reason to think Jesus spoke Greek, 
and that he very well could have taught in Greek, and he does cite the changed Septuagint version, then yeah, what does it mean? Now, the thing is, if, if, if the epistemic authority principle carries over here, it's okay for Jesus to cite the changed law, because both laws are kind of getting at the same thing. Even though, the, yes, the death penalty's changed, the point is, if, if Hebrew law was never meant to be taken as, this is do X, get Y, but rather, let me guide you. It's very important. This is my guiding for you. It's very important for you to know that your parents must be respected in the society in this, and they, they, you can't abandon them. Um, and you can't um, put them in a state of societal disrepair. Um, and it's, that's a there's a big consequence and that's a big problem if you do that kind of thing. And so if that's the legal wisdom here, and that would vary depending on honor-shame societies and how those rise and fall. That would differ depending on societal frameworks and, uh, and safety nets because uh, in a more ancient context, if you disavow your parents, well, go to the desert, buy, and die, right? They're done. But in, a, in our modern context, if I disavow my parents, they go, okay, well, I have my house and I'm good, so I'm sorry that we have a broken relationship. Right? And so it's just a diff there's different significances to depending on the context and the culture. So if that's the case, then it doesn't matter uh, when it comes to omniscience, which is your original question. I know I'm really leading into this one, but there's a lot of things to consider here. Uh, but let's say he's, yeah, uh, he's, he's citing it and it's, it's kind of by the book and this is it and he's citing a change law. Did he know that it's a different, uh, that it means something else? Uh, my personal take on Jesus' omniscience, and this uh, will certainly differ from person to person, is that we have to deeply respect the humanity of Jesus. I think Jesus was a human like you and me. I think Jesus experienced life like we experienced life. I think Jesus' omniscience, if we want to use that term, which is not used in the New Testament, uh, if we want to think of Jesus' omniscience, in my opinion, I think of him as you would be and I would be dependent on the Father. We are by the Spirit seeking God and depending on God. And Jesus, in doing so, the Father imparts Jesus' knowledge and points. So Jesus didn't know everything ever for all eternity in his finite human little brain. I think it would explode, right? Uh, he, he was a human dependent on the Father and his omniscience came in in the sense of God the Father revealing things to him. And so... Uh, in that way, I don't think it would even enter into this discussion. That's my opinion on my kind of Christological views and on Jesus' humanity, which is n not necessarily what we're talking about, but it is a very interesting thing to consider. Um, and then would Jesus know that the law was different? I guess it would depend on his, if he understood the idiom and if he understood the, his, the translation history and all these things. And maybe he did. Maybe he chatted with his uh, guys who read a lot of, uh, of Plato and the fourth century orators because they were well around. So the, maybe, maybe he did, but uh, it's a good question and a long answer. <laughs> well, I, to further engage with that question, I, I, it did cross my mind at one point as I was listening to your presentation that um, omniscience could be, you know, omniscience, omnipotence could be a way to explain it. But I also was thinking as well about the other angle of, of kenosis and the self-emptying and the though there could be the sort of omniscience or omnipotence at play what does it say about the incarnation um that there's an emptying there and there's a there's a willingness to uh in the willingness to become part of creation um there's also a willingness to engage with the fragility and uncertainty of creation mm -hmm. um and i'm thinking in particular about you talking about the trash piles and you know, dirt heaps of, of history and those actually being uh, local points of mediated divine self-revelation. Um, and so, like, what, do, what happens when we look at, um, you know, bring the understanding of mediation into the picture? There's a, there's a God that actually um, entrusts uh, mediation for self-disclosure and the uncertainty and fragility there but also the sort of power and, uh, and invitation there to engage in a dialogue. Um, it's more of a comment than a question. Um, <laughs> it's that's the theologian who is, 
is uh, sitting in on the Septuagint series. But what do you make of that angle in this discussion? Well, first off, it is the season of, this is more of a comment than a question, given the next two weeks. <laughs> but that's be all. But uh, I actually, I could just echo that and say, yeah, I agree. I think that that's the other angle of it, the kenosis angle, for sure. I don't really have any further comment. Thank you. Well, yeah. we have more questions. Sure. So, um, JD, would you like to ask your question or would you like me to read it out? And if, if you'd like to ask your question, just unmute your mic and go for it. Hey, this is JD. Uh, oh. what, well, it's more of a comment, but I was going to say that I think the slight differences between Exodus uh, Masoretic text and Deuteronomy in the Masoretic text is a really good example of seeing the text as legal wisdom. Because they they weren't they weren't uh, they weren't exactly the same like the Ten Commandments for example is like slight slight change not, not yeah differences but it's it maybe that influenced the Septuagint translators what do you think I think that's a really good comment in fact I think that's almost the crux of it all because when we talk about biblical law what does the Bible do with the Bible. Look at Exodus, as you just said. We'll take the exact example you just gave us. Exodus chapter 20 gives us the Ten Commandments. Deuteronomy, is it four or five? I'm, I'm blanking right now. But in any case, gives us the Ten Commandments again. You do see there's a specific change in the law and coveting. In Exodus, the wife is positioned as part of the property of the person. But in Deuteronomy, ostensibly at a later time, uh, the wife has been moved out of the property section. And so then you ask, your, you, you ask yourself, well, why? Because well, it's updating the law. You look at the slave law that we just talked about in Exodus, and you look at uh, verses 1 on chapter 21 up to verse is, uh, 11. They get, uh, to a degree, uh, recapitulated in Deuteronomy and to a degree in Leviticus. And, but you find little differences. Uh, you find that in Deuteronomy it talks about, whereas in uh, 1 to 6 in Exodus it's male slaves only, that male slaves law gets expanded to male and female slaves. And you look in Leviticus and you see that uh, the year of Jubilee starts to come into things. And that's not apparent in the original Exodus context, but why? Because they're using it as legal wisdom. They're looking at it and going, okay, that's a very good principle. Well, how can we think about it in, that, in a different context? What might be added to that? And uh, we, we, we see this uh, throughout the, the, he, the Hebrew Bible, particularly in the laws in the Pentateuch, which have often been in the past explained as hopelessly contradictory. But if we take it as, they, if we don't view things as statutory law, but as epistemic, an epistemic authority or legal wisdom, like you're saying, um, we can see that it makes sense in the Bible why these things are changing and why there are uh, quote unquote contradictions. Uh, I mean, uh, an example that comes to my mind even is in the book of Ruth, you might not know this, uh, Ruth is based off of the structure of the story, is based off of a law in Deut a section of laws in Deuteronomy. And the thing is, even though it's based off of, and this has been shown, um, a section of laws in Deuteronomy, in the story, they, they, they don't follow the laws of Deuteronomy. Like, so they're based off of the laws of Deuteronomy, but in the story, they don't even follow them. They actually break it and diverge in ways. And what does it tell us? And I'm getting this from, uh, particularly from the, the scholar that I quoted earlier, Joshua Behrman, in Inconsistency in the Torah, that uh, what's it telling us in Ruth is that they're, they're honoring it, but they're also seeing it as wisdom and that you can diverge in ways, but they're trying to follow the heart of it. So I think what you say is, actually a better way to go almost than even the presentation here. But this is a Septuagint lecture, and I'm trying to get, bring you some really interesting stuff in Septuagint research, along with um, biblical, uh, biblical studies in uh, its uh, Hebrew Old Testament context. But what you said uh, is very important because that brings, uh, if you don't like what I said about Septuagint, you need to go then to the Bible itself and then answer the question for yourself because this is happening there too. Uh, we have a two-part question from Daryl. Daryl, would you like to ask your question? If so, you can unmute your mic and, and share it with us. Okay, I'll read it out. So two-part question. What hermeneutical principles have your research revealed applicable for New Testament exegesis? And how do you see your findings affecting verbal plenary inspiration? Um, well, I mean, the hermeneutics part, that I was trying to kind of focus on that in, this, this, in the presentation, in the epistemic authority aspect of understanding the Old Testament. 
Um, it's a different lens to view law and instruction, and I think it helps us. Uh, and it, that actually might even <laughs> tie in to verbal plenary inspiration because uh, if, as we just discussed, and uh, it was the JD who asked the question, the J, uh, that his his question and a, a uh, really helpful comment about law laws being changed within the Bible, it, it points to um, a misunderstanding perhaps of uh, what it means for a contradiction to exist in the Bible. And so if we, with plenary inspiration, want to say all of the text is uh, uh, word, the word of God and uh, the text itself is important and is the communication of God, uh, then we have to, the only way we're going to get to that inspired text and meaning is if we understand the genre correctly. Because if we don't understand the genre cor correctly, we're going to be fighting battles on hills that we, don't, we shouldn't be on. And so uh, I think this, this entire way of looking at law and what the Septuagint helps us to see in these examples is uh, we want to make sure we're in the right fights. If, that's, if, if, that's, if inerrancy is something you want to, to uh, promote and have as a, a, a flagship element of your faith. Um, how does my research more broadly affect verbal plenary, uh, my understanding or an understanding of verbal plenary inspiration? Uh, I would pretty much just reiterate what I just said. I think it, it's, uh, I, I, am, I am someone who does take the text as authoritative, um, but I do so under the very large caveat that we must understand what the text was saying in its original context. We must understand the genre of the text. We must understand what the text was trying to teach, not looking at peripheral elements of, something, of the text, not, um, yeah, not the, the baggage that comes with it, but what is, the, what is this writer trying to tell us and teach us? And that is what I find to be the authority, the authoritative message of scripture. Um, and so, uh, that takes a lot of work, and I'm not going to pretend like I have a definitive answer for everything, but that's, that's kind of where I go currently in my life. Um, ask me again in a few years how I parcel these things. I find it all very difficult, and it's, these are, these are uh, perennial questions and issues that uh, we have to think through, but I think what the main pressing thing is we got to get the genre right. we got to know why things are happening in the text, and we live... and take this as the most important point out of all of this because I believe this so deeply. We live in the best time that has ever existed to study the Bible. Uh, we have so many resources. We have uh, so much at our fingertips. And we, it's really, the, the, the harvest is ripe, but the laborers are few. Uh, to come in and to really do some of the, the nitty gritty work of looking at ancient law codes, looking at the Septuagint law codes. No, the reason no one found this stuff, no one wanted to look at the, and that's not true entirely, but no one just, like, people don't do it. They don't look at all these ancient law codes. They don't try to find new ways of perceiving things. And so we live in a time that God, I think, is meeting the church in uh, rigorous and uh, full, uh, in a rigorous and full understanding of the text. And we should just embrace that and be very thankful for. Uh, we have a question from David. David, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, thank you. Um, Joel, thanks so much for this talk. It's been really interesting. Um, I really appreciate what you said about sort of legal wisdom and kind of trying to follow the spirit of the law in those sort of ways. Um, part of me, though, in the back of my mind has got the nagging question of, do, do we have kind of guardrails? Because it kind of the, the principle is great, but you can see how maybe this could be taken off in directions where you kind of go, oh, I don't quite want to go there. Now, in my head, maybe the best thing I'm thinking of maybe would be sort of the rest of scripture kind of functioning as a, you've got a set of bounds that kind of the rest of scripture tells us about where we might want to go legally and, and, and not so, so much. Um, in terms of, I think none of the changes that you've mentioned are against the rest of scripture. Um, but I was wondering if you had any further reflections maybe uh, or clarifications on, on ways that we might be able to to, to kind of embrace this idea of legal wisdom, but also have a good sense of where the bounds are within, actually, if we go too far, well, yeah, what counts as too far, effectively? Yeah. Does that make sense? That makes a lot of sense. Thank you so much. 
Yeah, and that, that's a great question. I started to kind of get at that or talk about that. Well, when does this principle break at the end? And then maybe that last example I gave it does break, you know? And that, that's very possible. I think that we need to make sure we're taking a macro perspective here. So in that I'm talking about, we're talking about law and legal wisdom, but the, the Torah, uh, despite what many people think, is not just a bunch of laws. The Torah is instruction of narrative. It's, instru it's, it's instruction in a much more holistic sense. And so I look to even Jesus here. What does Jesus do? You get a, whoever comes to him and says, hey, we can divorce our wife because Moses said so. And Jesus says, whoa, 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 whoa. That's a concession in that that's not the, that's not the best situation here. The law is giving you, again, a principle. Okay, life sucks sometimes and things happen and uh, people are terrible and divorces happen. That's a concession. What do we do in that situation to protect some people? Just like in the law we saw here in Exodus. If a, daughter, if a father sells his daughter as a slave, it's not saying, hey, everybody, go sell your daughters as slaves. Great thing. Like who on, like you, does anyone really think that's what that says? Because no, we all intuitively know it's horrible. No, one, no father wants to give his daughter as a slave wife. It's the worst case scenario. So in this worst case scenario, what do we do? It's a concession. Okay? Uh, what Jesus does, though, in that same uh, passage, when, he thought, when they come at him with a divorce law, he says, have you not read what, it, what, what God said from the beginning? And he brings in the narrative Torah to instruct the legal Torah. And so he pits wisdom against wisdom here and law against narrative. And he actually says, well, we actually know what the better situation is. And the better situation is a man and a woman um, being uh, this one flesh union. And that's what was, how it was from the beginning. And so he says, look to the rest of scripture to give us um, uh, guardrails, as you said, to, to keep us on a path because the law if it is legal wisdom, it's also, as I was saying, legal concession. And so we shouldn't see this as the best situation in all, of all time. It, it really takes a lot of discernment for each case. But I think Jesus' example of how he dealt with this uh, helps us move forward. Does, is that helpful? Yeah, thank you. Oh yeah, no problem. Um, it also strikes me too, as I listen to you talk, is a lot of this stuff, and Jesus is a model of this too, is it's worked out in dialogue, right? So a lot of the exchanges about laws, I mean, it's, it's actually imitating the way in which we're supposed to read the law, which is in dialogue, right? We read in dialogue with the text, but we read in dialogue with others. And it's through that interaction that new meaning is created, right? It's a communal discernment of wisdom. It's not the sole individual, you know, peering into the text with the microscope and finding it and establishing the guardrails, but a communal endeavor that continues onward, right? And hopefully in a way that leads to life and not to death. Um, yeah, I mean, what, I mean, what even is the principle in the New Testament? What, what does the old covenant, what, what, or what does the promise of the new covenant say? I will write the Torah on your hearts. The point being, I'm giving you wisdom, legal principles and wisdom here, but you're supposed to be able to carry this forward now by the spirit and go, okay, We've had our training wheels on. Let's take them off. Now we have the spirit. We're supposed to, in a community, actually discern the good and the evil as based on the help, of course, from the Torah, but we have to move it forward into our context, right? And that takes discernment. So, yeah, exactly. And in that regard, uh, John just has a, an aside comment, but I think it's worth reading. He says, uh, so biblical law is not best understood as one of strict constructionism with a smiley face emoji. Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so Mark asked a question about the book you mentioned um, in respect to Ruth being tied to the section of Deuteronomy. Can you just mention the title again? Yeah, that's Joshua Berman, B-E-R-M-A-N. The, the book is called Inconsistency in the Torah. It came out in 2017, I believe. And you'll just be able to see in the table of contents that he has a section on that. I believe it's his work. It might be somebody else's. I think it's him in tandem with somebody else who wrote on it as well. So uh, sorry for not giving props and kudos to that scholar, but it's in there. This question is from Thomas, who asked me to read it out. Um, reads, the fact that the Apocrypha was written after the translation of the Septuagint in 250 BC shows, in my opinion, that the Apocrypha was retroactively added and is not divinely inspired. Do we have an original Greek text without the Apocrypha, or do all available Greek texts include it? Like our like sets of like um, a codex, 
that what they're referring to? So uh, this, the Septuagint, the, or the codices of the ancient world, uh, they vary in what texts are included. Most of the time we have our Old Testament as we know it, but then there are often other Greek texts appended or included, and that list, as far as I'm aware, is not set, and it changes from like between like Sinaiticus to Alexandrinus, Vicanus, um, and so I I don't have that memorized. But uh, as far as I'm aware, they don't include much of the Apocrypha. Uh, I don't I I don't have these facts in my head. Sorry, but. Uh, the, the, the Apocrypha as, the, the, there's just, it's just some, it just depends. And so I, is there a set, a, a set of canonical texts? When, when is the first one, when does the first one appear? I mean, there's uh, Athanasius Pasch, Paschal Letter, and what is it, like 367 or something, where he cites just the typical Old Testament and New Testament books as we have, the, as we recognize them in the Protestant tradition. Um, and then you've got the, uh, there's like the, oh, what is it? Uh, there's that canon list, Murat Muratorian fragment from the second century, I think, that has the majority of our, of, of our what we would recognize as canonical. But, uh, I mean, you're asking a question of canon, and you're asking if the, the Apocrypha is not appended to particular sets. It just depends when, it depends which books. And then it, there's, there's a lot more that goes into the question of canon than just which books appear in a set of, uh, co in, a co in a codex, uh, or in a set of codices. And so I would say that uh, there's, just, there's more, think, more point, data points to consider than just that. Uh, there could be various reasons why texts are appended or are included. Could be that they're good reading, that people like, or helpful. Certainly things like First Enoch is very helpful when you think about Second Temple Judaism. Jubilees is helpful, Second Temple Judaism. Uh, the Maccabees books are incredibly helpful to understand what's going on in the New Testament. When you think about, uh, the, as in those texts, you've got, you've got a revolutionary riding in on a donkey, uh, and then you've got Jesus riding in on a donkey in parody of that. And so there's the, these books are helpful, so why, why are they appended? Uh, perhaps they're considered insp inspired by some communities, perhaps they're not. And so, uh, yeah, the question of canon is difficult. Um, it would require a lot more time to talk about, I think. It's a, it's, a, it's a nuanced debate. Thank you. I mean, what's interesting about just watching you uh, initially process that question is you can literally see from where I sit you going into your mind castle and mm -hmm. walking into each room. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Well, um, we probably have time for one more question before we close down. So if there's any one more burning question that people would like to uh, put out there before we end the evening, um, feel free. But if not, we can uh, call it a night and give Joel a, a warm round of applause. Oh, we have one more question from JD. So sure. go for it, JD. Hey, um, so I was thinking about rabbinic literature i mean this i guess this goes that's a whole nother rabbit hole yes but uh, i was thinking about how you know it's like aquila and these other guys that write the uh, other versions to septuagint were there are you aware of any like any major changes like along then too uh like uh, toward the second third century that probably affected judaism Oh, yeah, this is a huge question that my brain at this time of night might not do well with. Uh, yeah, so Aquila, Theodosian, Symmachus, the three, typically these well-known recensions of, uh, or even translations of, uh, of the Hebrew text and of the Septuagint. We've got a thing, uh, so do I know of any big changes off the top of my head? Uh, no, I mean, Aquila tries to be pretty insanely close to the Hebrew a lot of the time, to a, to a fault. So perhaps not there, unless it's a mistake or something like that. Um, but then again, there are obviously interpretive traditions that come into play. Uh, with respect to what I've said, uh, I've looked through the three, and um, to a degree, rabbinic literature. And I don't see 
Uh, I see actually divergences. Uh, so it looks like Symmachus, um, where it looks like sometimes they'll, they'll, they'll correct away from the Septuagint, what was going on in what I've, what I've shown. Um, but we don't, but we only have fragmentary evidence of them. We can get into things like, there's, there's kind of proto-Theodotion, they call it, so a recension that's going on um, in the, the time, really, of the New Testament, and we see um, kind of this kind of early recensional activity going on with Nahal Haver, uh, the, 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 man, or the, the text from there, uh, of the Minor Prophets, and so this kind of recension back to the Hebrew, um, to be more in line and faithful to the Hebrew than the Septuagint original translation was. Uh, and again, nothing is coming to mind of like these big significant changes, but uh, we do, oh, I think Paul actually at certain points, he quotes, uh, oh, is it in Corinthians, like a, a, a Theodosianic version of the text that, um, that we're pretty sure comes from that uh, recensional history. And so uh, there do seem to be the effects of the, the recensions and of other translations that peek their head uh, into the conversation of new uh, into the room of the conversation that's going on with the New Testament and the Old Testament, uh, not as much as the Septuagint because it's that's kind of the mono, the the more influential of the translations. But I wish I had a really good example for you, but nothing's coming to mind. So perhaps email me and I can uh, I can try and come up with a with a better answer. But a really kind of amazing example from one of the one of the the three or others. But uh, nothing's coming to mind. Okay. Well, only reason why I asked that is because um, we were talking about the dangerous slope that you could fall down if if you go off off principles, and uh, it's just like going back to the spirit of the law. And I think the people, uh, Jesus and the people of his time, they kept the spirit of the law, not the Pharisees. Though. Yeah, I mean that's it's an interesting comment. Um, I would caution a little bit when we speaking of Pharisees as a whole. There have been some really good works done in the last few years. Um, again, because of this is basically my bedtime. I can't. The authors' names are not coming to my head. A book on the Pharisees just came out. Uh, I think like one or two years ago, and we just we need to be careful of categorizing Pharisees as this catch-all for uh, those super um, legalistic bad guys. Uh, I think some of the Pharisees had issues, but I think to Pharisees as a whole were not necessarily a bad thing. Um, and I think that that's been pretty um, definitively shown in the last little while. And so it, there's, a, there's, a, there's a movement away from a, a, a full-on categorization of, of Pharisees as that kind of thing. Uh, but that's still, to, to your point, that yes, spirit of the law, and I mean, Paul was a Pharisee, and he became in line with the spirit of Jesus and the spirit of the law in the new covenant, giving of the spirit to put the law on, on his heart. And so, um, yeah, that's... We do need the we do need the guard the guardrails as you said for sure, um, but just a caution on the the Pharisee bit. Well, uh, I think I speak for everybody in tents that we really appreciate Joel your presentation, uh, the precision of your thought and your responses, and uh, for those who have joined us, we really appreciate your attendance. And this will not be the last of our Septuagint seminars. So um, we will be in contact letting you know when the next, next one is happening. And uh, some have asked if we'll be posting the recording uh, for, for later viewing and sharing and so on. Yes, we will. We'll send out uh, an email and, and let you know when the recording is posted so you can watch it again, share it with your friends and that sort of thing. So thank you for joining us and see you at the next seminar. Thank you so much for coming.